Okay. So thank you so much for registering and joining us this evening um, for our video presentation as well as discussion uh, with Russ, Russ Cohen, um, with Meredith Baxter from the Wild and Scenic Westfield River Program also. Exploring wild, wild Edibles on a Virtual Housatonic River Walk. So we can daydream about getting to do this in a few months ourselves. Um, and our programming, uh, we're working every day just about on getting the 2021 programming going. Um, quite excited for what's going to be coming up. Uh, we want to thank, as always, um, the uh, Berkshire Takana Community Foundation for the funding to do our programming. It's phenomenal. We like reaching out and seeing everyone's faces, whether it's in person at the library or um, virtually on Zoom. Thank goodness for Zoom, you know. Um, I'm going to keep everyone muted, but I am going to unmute uh, Meredith and Russ for a moment. Um, so Meredith can do a little bit of background and then um, actually Meredith, you might be able to undo yourself. That might be the easier because there's such a long scroll here. Sure, I'm undone. Okay, so there <laughs> we go, there is <laughs> Meredith Babcock. Hello everybody. Um, I had the absolute pleasure of getting to walk this river walk in Great Barrington with Russ Cohen and uh, we were going to do it as a collaboration of day to invite volunteers to gather last year. And it was with the Rivers Alliance and the Housatonic River Walk um, at the Great Barrington River Walk. And we had to cancel it because of COVID. And I said, wait, wait, let's meet anyway and I'll see what I can do to capture uh, Russ on film. And it ended up being this five part series, some of which you'll see tonight and some of which you can watch on your own um, through links. So that's all I have to say. I just feel really very um, excited that I can bring this amazing gentleman who also joined us tonight to all of you. Take it away, Russ. So can you hear me? Okay, so hi yes. everyone. Um, we're going to do a little virtual foraging expedition here along the Housatonic River and, uh, and uh, perhaps Meredith buried the lead, but uh, I think the real uh, focal point of the story is the river itself and this fabulous walk along the river that I hope you all, if you haven't already been there, that anytime you find yourself in Great Barrington, that you make a point to um, to allocate at least a good uh, 45 minutes or so to check out this uh, wonderful footpath uh, uh, along the river, uh, expertly built by Peter Jensen, that uh, it's you're you're literally one block away from bustling downtown Great Barrington, and it's all behind you because all you have is the rushing water and the beautiful native plants and just a gorgeous spot. And this was a spot that was just a horrible eyesore, just your classic neglected abused river system with you know all the concrete rubble going over the edge and you know, all the invasive species everywhere. And it was a, a hard place to love. And Rachel Fletcher, through her magic, you know, acting like a Pied Piper, was able to, to rally the town, thousands of volunteers over decades to just uh, bit by bit by bit uh, restore this river to the asset that it now is for that community. So uh, I love doing the walk at Riverwalk because that's the, you know, I was just the bait to get people to, you know, pay attention to this river. The real story is the river itself and this walk. And the fact that this is just such a wonderful example for all of us, all of our river communities to say, do we have spots like this where we could do a similar thing? Because it's just, as you know, the ability to people to get on rivers, to walk next to rivers, that's where the real relationship develops. And that's where people start to say, boy, this is a really great place. I need to bring my grandchildren here. I need to bring my fly rod here. Uh, I need to come here on a really hot day in the summer and just jump in. You know, that's 
what it's all about. So, so with that, uh, <laughs> let's put on these videos and, uh, and get a laugh or two. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Russ Cohen, and here we are along the glorious Riverwalk footpath along the Housatonic River in the scenic town of Great Barrington, Massachusetts, in the Berkshires. And we're here this morning to look at the edible wild plants that are growing along Riverwalk. And this is a great place to see and learn about edible wild plants. It's not a great place to actually pick and harvest them, but it's a great place to learn about them and you'll see some familiar plants that you'll know from your own neighborhoods, uh, perhaps growing in your own property where it would, of course, be okay to harvest and eat them. But this is a good spot to learn about them and observe them and then to generally leave them in place for others to enjoy. Although occasionally there will be things like uh, butternuts along the trail that would be okay to harvest. But mostly we're looking at plants here and not harvesting them. All right, here along Riverwalk, we've got a nice specimen of uh, a hazelnut bush. And there are two species of hazelnuts that are native to New England. There's the common hazelnut and the beaked hazelnut. And the only real difference between them is the appearance of the husks surrounding the nuts. The common hazelnut, the husk is going to be about an inch and a half in diameter, and it will look like a little head of cabbage. And then the nut ripens inside that. If it were the beaked hazelnut, the nut is in a little spherical uh, green uh, furry ball about um, five eighths to three quarters of an inch in diameter with a strange green thing sticking out of it about two inches long that looks like a bird's beak. But the nut inside is the same and I don't think the flavor varies between the, the common hazelnut and the uh, beaked hazelnut. So, uh, so you'll see here there's many multiple stems coming up in the same location that's very typical for the way this plant grows. And they tend to be um, sort of a shrubby tree. They never get more than about 15 feet tall. And so one spot I often, often encounter hazelnuts is underneath uh, uh, telephone lines or power lines. Uh, and I think they benefit from all the sun they get there. And in general, the telephone companies and the power companies tolerate the presence of the hazelnuts because they know that the trees will never get tall enough to short out the wires. And so where the hazelnuts grow in these uh, thickets, these dense uh, um, clumps of plants, they tend to inhibit the growth of the taller trees that could short out the wires. So hazelnuts are fun uh, in the spring, in the early spring, because they're one of our earliest blooming plants. So way before there are any leaves, uh, there are the male flowers called catkins. And here you can see an, an old remainder of a catkin from um, last year that just didn't form well this year. But the ones that did form this year would have elongated and been about two inches long shedding pollen. And then near those catkins on the same plant are these gorgeous little ruby red female flowers. And so the wind carries the pollen from the male catkins to the female flowers. And then that's where the nuts form on the plants. So I was checking this common hazelnut to see if I could find any developing nuts on here. And I can't see any. And it might be that this particular bush is going to have an off here and just not produce well. Uh, but it is sort of early in the season. So ordinarily, I'm not looking for the developing husks on the plant until well into the summer. And the nuts are going to be ripe uh, toward the end of the summer. So usually first couple weeks of September is when I'm gathering them. And uh, so you'll see on this common hazelnut, that green, about an inch in diameter, uh, green husk that looks like a little head of cabbage that surrounds the nut. And as it ripens, the two halves of the uh, husk open up and then inside you see you know the familiar hazelnut nut and eventually when it's fully ripe either the whole husk falls off the ground or the nut falls out of the husk on the ground so if you want to gather hazelnuts do not wait though until that happens because if you do you will never get any nuts yourself the squirrels and chipmunks will get all of them before you do so what you need to do is time your visit to the hazelnut tree so that the nuts are still attached to the tree in their husks and haven't fallen off yet, but are as close to ripe as possible. 
and that's usually the first or second week of September. So that's when I would check them. And the husk usually would begin to turn uh, a little golden or a little brown just before it falls off. And that's when to gather them. And, um, and I would be misleading you if I said to you, you haven't lived to try the flavor of a wild hazelnut because it's more or less the same flavor as a cultivated hazelnut. And our wild nuts are smaller in size than domesticated filberts that you could buy at the store. And so you might say, I'll just go to the store and buy hazelnuts, which is fine, but I want to just tell you and reassure you that I have certainly in Massachusetts found places where I've gathered hundreds and hundreds of hazelnuts. So it is possible to do that if you want to. This appears to be some developing hazelnuts inside the fertilized female flowers. So uh, by early September, first couple weeks of September, these will have expanded to over an inch in size with the nut inside. So that's what I would look for later in the season. And then also on this one, we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, double tooth thing I was describing. So here on the leaf, you see the larger teeth, one, two, three, four, five, and then all the little serrations between it. That's what's known as double tooth. That's a way to help distinguish the hazelnut plant from other things. A lookalike, which is witch hazel, which isn't edible. It's a medicinal plant where the uh, lobes are much rounder. So if you're seeing this double toothed action, that uh, is one of the uh, distinguishing features of a hazelnut bush. All right, so that's hazelnut. Let's see what else we can find here. All right, here along Riverwalk, we've got two great examples of a native tree called a basswood. So the botanical name for this one is Tilia americana. And uh, you may also, depending upon where you're from, you may more readily encounter another species called Tilia cordata, which is the little leaf linden, which is deployed a lot as a street tree in cities. Uh, I'm happy to tell you from a foraging perspective, the species are the same. In fact, all species of Tilia can be treated the same way. And the two edible parts on the basswood tree or linden tree, if you prefer, uh, are the young leaves and the flowers. So on this uh, sapling here, we've got some leaves and these are probably uh, just uh, maybe uh, uh, a few days beyond the ideal stage to eat them. But I would harvest, you know, uh, especially if I've been here several days ago, I would have harvested this young leaf and just eaten it right on the spot if you want to. It's a mild uh, flavor and slightly mucilaginous, and, um, and it's fine to eat it just plain right off the tree, or you can uh, put it into salads. Or in England, the, the linden trees are called lime trees in England, and they'll make these uh, lime tree sandwiches, which are like the watercress sandwiches on the white bread with a crust cut off, and they will just layer the young linden leaves as the filling for the sandwich. All right, so that's the first stage. And before I go on and talk about the flowers, let me just point out very helpful distinguishing characteristic to look for to uh, know uh, the plants in the Tilia genus. You see how asymmetrical the leaf is. So I look for that and, uh, and that's very useful. And then if we come over to this other um, basswood, this has the other part on the plant that is very uh, helpful to distinguish it. And if you look on the plant right here, you can see the flowers getting ready to bloom. And then there's this structure right here. Let me just break one off. So you... All right, so the second part on a basswood or linden tree that you can eat are the flowers. You actually make a drink from the flowers. And here we have the flower bud showing up. And this thing right here is called a bract. And that um, uh, has a function that will uh, happen when the flowers uh, bloom and turn into little nutlets and in the fall this whole thing breaks off and then it does this like a helicopter as it's falling toward the ground and the uh, trick is that the uh, that slows the rate that the seeds fall on the ground and gives the chance for the wind to blow it further away so that the uh, tree will help to spread itself further away than if the uh, nutlets just all went clunk right underneath the tree. Okay, so here uh, there's going to be soon the flowers blooming at the end of this little stem right here and the flowers will have a, a yellowish green color and they'll be very fragrant and have a very nice uh, lemon uh, honey type smell. 
and that's what you make the tea from. You just uh, steep the hot, uh, flowers in hot water for a few minutes and you have a delightful, delightfully flavored tea that also has two medicinal values. It's soothing to your digestive system and your mental state at the same time. So it's a very highly regarded tea by herbalists in Europe and in the United States. Let me just add one thing about the ecological value of this plant. When, when people uh, become aware of the need for us to care about pollinators and to plant pollinator gardens and stuff like that, and that of course is very important, they tend to be thinking about the herbaceous plants as the pollinator plants. Well, we have trees that are pollinator plants too, and the basswood would fall into that category because when these flowers are blooming, and it won't just be the flowers within humans reach standing on the ground, these trees get to be 40, 50, 60 feet tall, and they're blooming from top to bottom. And so uh, the pollinators can be flying into the upper branches so the pollinators can visit all the flowers they need, even if you're harvesting some from ground level to make the tea. Uh, but when the plant is blooming, uh, you can hear the tree before you see it because of the buzzing of all the insects visiting the flowers at that time. And uh, let me just add finally that I'm not surprised that we're finding the basswood along the river here because it is a species that uh, I often see in and along rivers. All right, let's move to the next one. All right, here along Riverwalk in Great Barrington, we've got an excellent example of a elderberry bush. And let me just say, this is the common elderberry. Here in the Berkshires, we also have the red buried elder. And the red buried elder has a pyramidal shaped flower cluster and a cluster of red berries that come out in the summer. That is not edible. This is the edible one. This is called the common or the black buried elder. Uh, Sambuca nigra or Sambuca canadensis, depending upon which botanist you're talking to. And, um, and this is growing in exactly the kind of habitat we'd expect an elderberry to grow because it likes open, sunny, damp, meadowy habitat. And so growing along a river is a comfortable location for elderberry to find itself in. So there's two main edible parts on an elderberry. So let's talk about the flowers first. So you see right here, the developing flower cluster. So these will be ripe later in June and it's going to be much, much bigger than this. It will range in diameter from about four inches to about nine inches in diameter. And then these little green uh, flower buds will turn into flowers. And each individual flower is small, but the cluster itself, I say, could be as much as uh, eight or nine inches in diameter. And some people gather those flower clusters and uh, They'll fry them in fritter batter. Um, uh, there's another flower, I think, that makes a much tastier fritter than the elderberry flowers, and that's uh, the black locust uh, flower, which uh, the flowers taste like uh, sweet pea pods. And that's the one I would use for fritters instead of the elder flower. And then also people will gather elder flowers and make a drink from them. And there's an alcoholic version and a non-alcoholic version. Uh, and that is a possibility, but I personally uh, tend to leave the flowers on the plants because then the flowers can uh, benefit the pollinators. And remember, if you're picking a flower off the plant, you're not going to get any berries in that spot. So I tend to leave the flowers on the plant and wait for the berries to develop. So in the places where you're seeing the flower buds, this is where the berries will be. So these bloom in June in a couple weeks and then the berries will ripen uh, toward the end of the summer. So we're talking usually around Labor Day or a week or so afterwards. And what will happen is the berries will start out green and then turn maroon color and then purple and then eventually they'll be very close to black in color. And as I said, the cluster will be about this big and it will hang upside down like that when the berries are fully ripe from the weight of the fruit pulls the whole cluster upside down. Now, I understand that you can get a stomach ache if you eat a lot of ripe elderberries, but if you dry them first or you cook them first, they're safe to eat as many as you want. And I tend to mix elderberries and apples together. So like elderberry applesauce, elderberry apple pie is more interesting than just plain applesauce and apple pie. And last thing I'll say about elderberries is uh, occasionally you go to these uh, uh, drug stores and apothecaries that will offer products uh, where they that have elderberry in them where they claim that it's good against the flu. 
And I suspect that it is, but you don't have to pay the high prices that they try to charge you in the stores like that. It's basically elderberry juice, so you could make your own. So you harvest the ripe uh, elderberries toward the end of the summer and just simmer the uh, ripe fruit in water to soften it up. And then you could put it through a fine mesh sieve just to hold back the seeds, whatever. And then you would have your juice, which you could uh, uh, drink uh, or you know take by the teaspoonful, whatever. Uh, or add it to other things, or you could freeze it, use it later on, or you could make a tincture from it so you're adding alcohol to prolong its shelf life and then have it that way. So once again, this is the, the common elderberry, relatively common plant, uh, but even so, I encourage uh, responsible harvesting of these plants in the wild uh, to make sure that uh, the plants are able to continue to thrive in locations where we're finding them because one of the things that native plants do is they often have important ecological roles. They're animals that rely upon them for food as some other important portion of the life cycle. So in the case of elderberries, there is an insect called the elderberry borer beetle that has a very important and intimate association with this plant. So the mature beetles, which are gorgeous by the way, they're iridescent blue and gold in color, so the mature beetles will mate on the elderberry plants. The females will lay the eggs on the elderberry plants. The larvae live inside the elderberry plants and the larvae don't harm the plants because the insect and the plants are, you know, have co-evolved for many generations. So they're in dynamic equil equilibrium, they're okay. And so that's why it's important if you're gonna harvest uh, edible parts of elderberries is to not harvest so much that we begin to lose elderberries in landscape because that elderberry borer, borer beetle would lose its habitat then. All right, let's see what else we can find. Riverwalk is a great example of a citizen-driven restoration project where they took a rubble-strewn eyesore uh, that was neglected by the town and turned it into a spectacular showpiece by cleaning it up, removing the rubble, removing the invasive species planted with uh, native species. Uh, but this has been an excellent uh, showpiece to show off native plants. And uh, this is a place where people can walk and appreciate the plants. And uh, while this isn't really a great place for people to collect and eat plants growing here at Riverwalk, it's a great place to see the plants growing in the natural riparian habitats. And many of these species are very appropriate for people to establish in their own yards. And perhaps they'll get the idea from seeing the plants at Riverwalk that, gee, this plant is nice. It would be nice to have this in my own yard. And then they can uh, establish uh, their own growth there. And of course, once the plant's growing in your own yard, uh, you can nibble on it all you want. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, this little excursion we've had along Riverwalk with me this morning and learned a few things about these edible uh, plants that we've encountered along the way. And I hope that we'll be able to get together in person sometime and uh, do some more wild edibles here, uh, Long River Walk in Great Barrington. So I believe the plan is to continue and watch three of the different segments. So there might be a little repeat in the opening and closing, but uh, that way you'll get a nice chunk of the amazing plants. But since I'm not in charge of the uh, technical side of the program, <laughs> are you there? Whoops. Yes, we're there. Here it comes. Oh, wonderful. Good morning, everyone. I'm Russ Cohen, and here we are along the glorious Riverwalk 
footpath along the Housatonic River in the scenic town of Great Barrington, Massachusetts in the Berkshires. And we're here this morning to look at the edible wow plants that are growing along Riverwalk. And this is a great place to see and learn about edible wow plants. It's not a great place to actually pick and harvest them, but it's a great place to learn about them. And you'll see some familiar plants that you'll know from your own neighborhoods, uh, perhaps growing in your own property where it would, of course, be okay to harvest and eat them. Okay, here just off the Riverwalk pathway, we've got uh, some nice examples of spice bush. So this is a, a native plant to this area, and I'm not surprised that it's here along the river because where I typically encounter this plant is as an understory plant underneath hardwood trees in an area where there is a, a, a river or a perennial stream or even an intermittent stream and where the ground is rocky. That's typically where you see spice bush, although uh, you can plant it in a larger range of habitat than where it naturally occurs. So you can plant it in the sun and it's fine there. So this is one of our native species that the American colonists turned to to make tea from during the Revolutionary War era. So they would just take the twigs like this and just steep these twigs in hot water. And so I call this one of the scratch and sniff species because if you scratch the outer bark off and you sniff the inner bark, it has a strong spicy smell. So that's one of the edible uses for spice bush. The other one is the spice bush berries. Now let me just say that spice bush comes in male and female plants, so it's only going to be the female plants that have the berries on them. And these fruits will be ripe uh, in uh, the first half of September. And so uh, here, uh, when we're filming this at the end of May, the plant bloomed uh, last month but we should be able to find some uh, very young developing berries on the plant if this is a female plant. So let's look for those right now. Okay, so we're looking underneath and here we found some. So let me just pick this off to show you. So right here are some baby female spice bush berries. So these will be full size in September and they'll be bright shiny blood red in color and they'll be about the size of a tic tac and so that's the second edible part on a spice bush plant and what I will do is dry those berries and then grind them up and use them as a savory spice so uh, a lot of the books that mention the spice bush berries and their edibility describe it as an allspice substitute which I personally think is incorrect because allspice is a sweet clovey type flavor and I find the spice bush berries to be a savory flavor. So they're good for things like uh, soups, omelets, casseroles where you want to add a savory flavor. And so, so as I say, look for the bright red berries in September, gather some and bring them home. And what I will do is just spread them out on a cookie sheet uh, and just allow them to dry for about a month and the berries will lose that bright red color and it will turn a dull reddish brown color and then the berries get wrinkly but once those berries are dried you can store them in a glass jar in your pantry and they'll keep for years without going bad and then when you're ready to use them just grind some up with a little mortar and pestle and then add them to your food to get that spice in there all right but let me uh say how important these berries are to migrating songbirds because uh, the berries are ripe in September which is around the time when our songbirds are thinking that it's time to start getting ready to fly south for the winter and so what they will do is try to fatten up and add some body weight to fuel their southward migrations and the spice bush berries are very high in lipids which is a vegetable fat and the songbirds know that and so they will seek out the spike berry, spice bush berries to eat to, uh, to fatten up. And so if you're going to harvest spice bush berries from the wild, it's very important to leave lots of berries on the plants to make sure the birds get all they need. Here just off the pathway at Riverwalk is a nice patch of a native uh, member of the Rubus genus. And this particular one is called the flowering raspberry. This is Rubus odoratus. And um, but it's in the same uh, genus as uh, all of our other raspberries and blackberries and stuff. And they're all edible. They're all useful just about the same way. So you do not need to know what exact species you have. But this one 
is uh, definitely one of the more distinctive looking members of the genus because first of all it has these maple-like leaves that's different from most of its kin uh, that are raspberries and blackberries and also you see I'm grabbing the stem on the plant and I'm not getting prickered there's no thorns on these plants so that's another nice thing and then the really nice thing about this plant that we can't see yet because it's not happening yet are the flowers but these are very showy flowers. They're uh, magenta in color, five petals, which is typical of plants in the rose family that this plant is in. So they're gorgeous looking. And then there's the raspberry fruit, which will form later in the summer. And I'll have to say that probably a regular red raspberry fruit is a little bit nicer tasting than these flowering raspberries, just because the red raspberry fruit is juicier but these are perfectly edible and they have a nice flavor and they're fun to nibble on as you encounter these plants uh, along the trail or uh, you can occasionally find enough that you could actually uh, make something from the flowering raspberries. So um, <clears throat> this would certainly be a species worth considering for your yard for planting even if you never ate it just to look at it because it is a visually um, appealing plant <clears throat> especially when the flowers are out. And I'll just tell you that where I tend to see this plant is uh, where the ground is damp and in dappled sunlight. And that's exactly the conditions we're finding it here at Riverwalk. But if you have a place like that, then flowering raspberry would be a good thing to consider uh, growing. All right, let's see what else is here. All right, here, uh, just off the path at Riverwalk, we've got a nice patch of ostrich ferns. And this is the species that the fiddleheads come from, the edible fiddleheads that you may have seen in the stores or gathered yourself. Now, uh, almost all ferns go through the fiddlehead stage. So not all fiddleheads are edible, though, because uh, um, most fern fiddlehead species don't taste good. I only know two species that taste good and only one that's safe, safe to eat in quantity, and that's this one, the ostrich fern. So I'm going to teach you the ways to distinguish the ostrich fern from any other species of fern. So the first thing you look for is habitat, and here uh, we're in the alluvial floodplain soil next to the Housatonic River, and this is very typical habitat for ostrich ferns to grow in. So it'd be very unlikely for you to find an ostrich fern, let's say in the top of a mountain or in a really rocky soil, because that's not where uh, this fern tends to grow. Second thing, second thing you want to look for is the ostrich ferns tend to grow in a vase-shaped clump, which you see here. And, um, and when these fronds are at the curled up edible stage, the fiddlehead stage, though little clump of fiddleheads is also in a vase-shaped clump. Next thing to look for, and I'll just pick one of these fronds to show you, is if you look at the center of the frond, you'll see that there's a gouge running down the entire length of the stem. And uh, if you cut this in cross section, you'll see that it forms a U like a celery stalk. So look for that. And, uh, and when, once again, these fronds are at the curled up fiddlehead stage, that uh, gouge uh, running down the stem, that's on the fiddleheads too. All right, next thing to look for is uh, the fertile fronds, which is the spore bearing fronds. And here's one right here. So this is how the plant reproduces. And you won't find these attached to every clump of the ostrich fern fiddleheads that you'll see, but you typically in a patch of ostrich ferns, you'll find at least one of these. And you'll see on the stem of the fertile fronds, it's also got that gouge running down it. So that's a helpful characteristic. And then the last distinguishing feature that I can't show you right now because we're not at the right time to see it is when those ostrich fern fiddleheads are at this stage, the edible stage, on the outside of this part, the curled up part, which is called the crozier, you'll see these brown papery scales that flake off really easily with your fingers. So that's distinguished from, let's say, a wool that you'd see on the outside of a cinnamon fern fiddlehead. 
Uh, so you want to see the brown papery scales that flake off really easily with your fingers. So combination of that, the vase-shaped clump, the uh, gouge running down the center, the alluvial floodplain soil, uh, those are the characteristics of the ostrich fern to distinguish it from other things. Now you do have to boil ostrich ferns to make them safe to eat. There's actually an enzyme in them called thiaminase, which breaks down thiamine, vitamin B1, in your body. So you can actually develop a vitamin B1 deficiency if you eat insufficiently cooked fiddleheads. So I encourage people to boil them, um, I would say at least four or five minutes. Some people might say even longer. And then after you do that, you could eat the fiddleheads just plain, or that would be the time to think about what other dishes you'd use the fiddleheads in, like soups or omelets or casseroles. But do boil them first before uh, you eat them. We have found a little surprise on the ostrich fern, and that is this moth right here. And I'm not a moth expert at all, but it certainly is a gorgeous one. And it is possible that this is a species that um, might even like to lay its eggs on ostrich fern. And that's why it is here uh, and does not seem to be deterred by our presence. But it's a nice reminder of the fact that although we might be nibbling on these plants, that um, the other creatures that depend on them too. And on that subject, let me just say that when I'm harvesting ostrich fern fiddleheads in the wild, I'm picking one or maybe two of the cold up parts per clump. That's it. And I let the rest grow out. And that is a sustainable way of harvesting the plant. And that way you're not depleting too much energy from it. Because unfortunately, some people get a little greedy and they'll pick every single curled up ostrich fern fiddlehead that they find and that saps a lot of strength from the plant and you could even kill the plant by harvesting it so hard. So once again I encourage one or two ostrich ferns per clump and that's a sustainable way of harvesting the plant. At Riverwalk it's a great place to see the plants growing in uh, uh, the natural riparian habitats and many of these species are very appropriate for people to establish in their own yards and perhaps they'll get the idea from seeing the plants at Riverwalk that gee this plant is nice it would be nice to have this in my own yard and then they can uh, establish uh, their own growth there and of course once the plant's growing in your own yard uh, you can nibble on it all you want. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, this little excursion we've had along Riverwalk with me this morning and learned a few things about these edible uh, plants that we've encountered along the way and I hope that we'll be able to get together in person sometime and uh, do some more wild edibles here uh, along River Rock in Great Barrington or some other spot along some other river in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. That is so wonderful. Meredith, you want to um open up a question and answer and discussion with Russ? Sure, I think that'd be, is that all right with you, Russ? We're gonna change our, um, we were gonna watch three segments, but because they're available at other times and we don't always have Russ here with us, I thought it would be a nice opportunity to be able to ask any questions or um, share your own experience with having maybe tried to gather these or, utilize this time as a sharing. Does that sound good for everyone? Okay, um, we'll have to unmute ourselves as we go. So just make sure to unmute. And if someone has a question. All right, Marie, go ahead. Hi, um, this was very interesting. Um, a little of your background, Russ, what, what got you into this? How long have you been doing it? Okay, so I have been teaching uh, other people wild edibles since 1974 when I was a senior in high school. <laughs> wow. uh, so I've been at it a little while. And, okay. uh, and I'm, always, I'm always learning new things. Uh, you know, there's there's over 200 species of edible wild plants that um, grow in the Northeast. So uh, I've eaten the vast majority of those, but there's still a few I haven't found yet. I haven't tried yet. So uh, there's that. And, and the other thing I'm doing since I retired from my day job, which is working for the Mass uh, Division of Ecological Restoration, 
I'm playing the role of Johnny Appleseed for native edible species. And I've set up a nursery near where I live uh, outside of Boston, where I've got over a thousand plants. And yeah. then I work out arrangements with cities and towns, state and federal agencies, schools and colleges, tribal groups, and others to plant plants for my nursery in appropriate places on their properties. And Riverwalk is one of those sites. So um, I don't think any of the plants we covered so far in the segments that we watched tonight are plants that I contributed to Riverwalk, but I think later on on some of the other video <laughs> segments, we do talk about them. So I'm pretty sure we talk about sassafras and sassafras is a plant that grows in Berkshire County, but there wasn't any along the Riverwalk. And I thought, well, this is a cool plant. We should have some here so people could see it. So we planted some sassafras uh, that I got from Eastern Mass and I'm happy to say it's doing really well along the river. Good. So you must be familiar with that series of books years ago, Stalking the, the Wildlife. Yes, by Ewell Gibbons, a wonderful writer. <laughs> yes. So um, I should say, since this talk tonight is sponsored by a library that I owe a great debt of gratitude to my town, the town of Weston Mass's town library, where I went in the summer of 1972 and took out every book I could find on wild edibles, uh, including a lot by Ewell Gibbons. And... <laughs> um, and top, you know, I learned about two dozen species in an edible botany class that my high school biology teacher had, had mm. taught that previous spring. But I taught myself over 70 more species. So that's why by wow. senior of high school, I was able to teach the course I had taken as a sophomore. Great, okay. And could I just ask one question, Deb? Did yes. you used to teach at the high school in Lynn? I did, I saw you, Marie. Oh, nice how are you? you? Nice to see no, you. It's okay. good to see you. Great, all right, thank you. Mm. I will mute myself again. Does anyone else have a question for us? All right, go ahead, Deborah. Um, it's not really a question, it's a comment. First of all, loved this, thank you. Wish, really wish it was spring and we were all out there, but um, I wondered if anybody else noticed that moth, you know, you've always, I've always heard how they're designed like that to scare off predators, but this one, was really remarkable. It, it looked like eyes staring. So that was just something that I, I thought I'd comment on because it was beautiful. So uh, one thing I didn't talk about uh, in the video, but I talk about when I give PowerPoints on uh, edible natives is a really cool lepidopteran species that grows on the spicebush and sassafras. Mm -hmm. And it's called the spicebush swallowtail butterfly. And the butterfly in and of itself is pretty, but the really cool part is the caterpillar. So, uh, so the butterfly, female butterfly lays the eggs on the spice bush or sassafras leaves, and then the eggs hatch, and then this little caterpillar forms. And at its early stages, it looks like bird poop. So it's a really ingenious disguise. So the birds aren't paying attention to it. It looks like excrement. So why would they be interested in that? And then it quickly morphs from that into a green or greenish yellow caterpillar that has these enormous fake eye patches on the top of its head that make it look like a snake. And so that scares <laughs> birds away from eating it. And then as its final act of deception, as it uh, metamorphoses <clears throat> into a pupa, the pupa looks exactly like a dried leaf. So uh, I'm just so awed by the ability of this organism to evolve these ingenious disguises to avoid getting eaten. And so, if, yeah, so if you plant spice bush in your yard, you may get one of these uh, critters. Uh, they show up on the spice bush plants I'm growing in my nursery, which is really fun. Well, I'm, I'm secretly hoping that Beckett. Uh takes it upon ourselves to start our own little mini river walk right down there on town property at the end of Main Street. So we'll we'll keep you we'll keep you informed, Russ. <laughs> Sounds good. Oh, that would be lovely. Does anyone else have a question or a comment that they would like to share? Thank you so much. I took notes, but maybe I'll get to see this again. Thank you. Uh, I, I do have a question um, yes. for us. How can we find you in uh, Weston? Do you have a web, what's your website? All right, so uh, I, 
I don't have a nifty domain name because I just don't bother with stuff like that. But if you Google me, if you go to Google and type Russ Cohen into the search box, you go straight to my website. Okay, great. And that has the uh, uh, the list of uh, public foraging programs I do. Yeah, Meredith's holding up my book. Uh, oh. Yeah, so there's uh, information about my book there too. Oh, and um, and uh, I typically, in a typical year, and this is like a non-pandemic year, I do about 40 public programs, walks and talks. Uh, you know, something sponsored by libraries like tonight, but also a lot of in-person things. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that, of course, got whacked pretty seriously by the pandemic. But I already have uh, at least a couple in-person programs lined up for this year. So if you go to my website, you'll see a very preliminary schedule of what I've got lined up so far for this year. And there's maybe, I don't know, seven or eight things on there. And there'll be at least two or three times that many um, as I work out arrangements with sponsors in, in the next month or two. Great. Well, thank you so much. Oh, sure. Fascinating. Open my, opens my eyes and senses. And we will have the book within the next couple of weeks in the catalog. So people are going to be able to check it out. Um, and Russ, at some point, I'd love to discuss, we've had a request with our community survey in 2020 to arrange outings. So I'm thinking and outing um, somewhere that you're doing one of your walks uh, would be lovely. Yeah, so that we'll be in communication about that, yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, Meredith has been after me to lead one in the Westfield watershed. Yeah. And I've been uh, searching so far in vain to find a spot that I felt had a critical mass of wild edibles that, because, mm -hmm. you know, ideally, the more there are, the easier it is for me, because I don't have to work so hard to find things to talk about. Right. So it's a nice thing about Riverwalk, because you have a relatively condensed space. And so, as Meredith can tell you, you know, we'd, we'd find one and then five feet further down the trail, the next one would be. So it's just really good spot to do a video like that, because we could, uh, you know, cram a lot in in just a very short space. So that's why, Russ, I've decided that we need to build our own uh, so we that go. we'll really yeah. eat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which, uh, um, you know, just about any spot that you pick is going to have some stuff there. Uh, and, and, but just about any spot will have an opportunity to further diversify it with additional edible native species. And that's what I love to do with plants from my nursery. Good. Well, if no one else has another question, Jody, I think maybe we could watch the third um, one, unless there's another. Um, Valerie, did you have something you wanted to ask? Um, I was just going to say thank you, and I was going to ask Russ if he had a book, but he uh, but he answered that question already. It looks like I can go to his website and and um, see it there. And I guess I'm wondering, you know, how hard is it to find these things? Do you have to traipse all over Hill and Dale to find something? Um, uh, some of the edible wild plants in the book are uh, exceedingly easy to find, like dandelions, for example. Oh, I got uh, them in my front yard. Yeah, yeah. dandelions <laughs> are one of my most favorite vegetables to eat, cultivated or wild. The, the flavor is like a cross between corn, spinach, Brussels sprouts, and artichokes. And the part I'm eating on them are the flower buds. So the time to gather them in the Berkshires is like the end of April, beginning of May. Oh. And uh, my favorite place to gather them is on the edges of organic farms where the dandelion plants can get really big. Mm -hmm. And so I would avoid gathering them from, you know, really fussed over areas, closely cropped lawns, you know, really manicured areas where yeah. you have to worry about lawn chemicals and stuff like right, that. Right. But on the edge of an organic farm, which you've got many in the Berkshires, and usually the farmers are fine with it. You just talk to the farmer, or somebody on the staff there and say, is it okay if I pick your dandelions? And, uh, and usually, um, they say, fine, you know, go at it. And I've seen some really large plants in places like that where you find over 200 dandelion buds per plant. Mm. And yeah, they're small. It takes a little while to pull them off. But if you're finding plants like that, you can have all you need to feed yourself, your dinner guests, uh, whatever. I mean, <laughs> when we have dinner guests again, won't that be nice? So we can have people over again. So at least your family, people you're living with, you could feed them dandelion buds. And, um, and to prepare them, all you do is just 
dump them in a uh, bucket of water just to wash them off and get a pot of water boiling in the stove, dump the dandelion buds in and boil them for 60 seconds. That's it, that's all they need. And then you can throw them into soups and omelets and casseroles or pizza topping, other things. But before you do anything with them, before you even put any salt or butter on them, just try them plain. I think you'd be amazed at how good they are. Mm. Yeah, so there's plants like that that are that just about everybody knows, oh, I know a good spot for dandelions. And then sure, uh, there's definitely more obscure things uh, you know, that I talk about that you don't run into that often. But, um, but there's also a lot of stuff that is very easy. And so, um, so uh, organic farms are a great place to go foraging. And I, I, I know in an audience like this, I don't have to convince you of you know, why organic farms are valuable for the main reason they exist, which is to provide us with food because as, yummy, as many yummy weeds and invasive species there are out there, there aren't enough to you know, put a significant dent in our food supply. So we need to grow food and organic is a great way to do it. But, uh, but organic farms are great foraging opportunities. And, and let me just quickly go over those. So uh, the reasons for that. So reason number one is the obvious one. They're not slathering everything with chemicals. Reason number two is that the way that weeds are managed at organic farms is they're doing it strategically. They're not weeding every square inch of the farm every single day. They weed where they need to and where they don't, they just let it go. So if you time your visit right to an organic farm, you can find huge amount of weeds, enough to feed whole armies. If I've got a big dinner party plan, which I haven't been doing lately, but I look forward to doing it again, and I need lots of raw material, I can go to an organic farm and find all I need that way. Then the third reason is the wonderful living soil that makes the organically grown fruits and vegetables so nutritious to eat. All the good stuff is getting into the weeds too. So the weeds you harvest at organic farms are going to be luscious and nutritious and yummy and, uh, and uh, much better than let's say weed growing in a crack in a sidewalk. And then the last reason why organic farms are good foraging opportunities is the edges of the organic farms, the sunny edges, uh, are great habitat for fruit trees, nut trees, berry bushes, and stuff like that. So my advice is to form a symbiotic relationship with your local organic farmer because yeah. they have the weeds, you want the weeds, so potentially it's a great partnership. So once again, talk to somebody first at the farm, make sure they're okay with what you're doing. And then, it, and actually that's general advice I, I would uh, suggest for any kind of foraging you do is if, if it is at all possible to find a landowner, find a land manager and just check in with them and say, uh, I see you've got some, you know, something, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to pick. Is it okay with you? And very, very rarely have I been turned down. Usually people are very flattered and, and really like the fact that you've taken the courtesy to ask them. And once you have that permission, you can forge in really joyful way. You don't have to be like looking over your shoulder every once in a while saying, somebody going to, you know, get miffed that I'm doing this. So that's really good. And let me just tell you one uh, uh, example of that. That's uh, a plant that um, grows in Berkshire County, really good one, uh, the black walnut tree. And although it's not native to Berkshire County, it's native to Connecticut, which is in the same eco region that we're in. So I consider it native to Massachusetts. And these are the things that show up on the ground and look like old green tennis balls in October. And they just pile up there. So as I'm traveling around the landscape, in October, and I see somebody's yard with a bunch of those black walnuts just all over the lawn, I'll go knock on the door and I'll ask the person who answers the door, I say, I see you've got some black walnuts. Would you mind if I harvested some? And the typical response I get is, wait a minute, let me get my wheelbarrow and fill it up for you because uh -huh. they're sort of smelly, they're kind of messy. And so the landowners are kind of eager to get them off their property. If they have somebody that actually wants them, uh, that's terrific. So that's a typical response I get, you know, when I ask to go foraging on somebody's land. One of the things I really adore about Ross is his encouraging people, if they do like the idea of foraging, to start to create the foraging opportunity in their own yard. So instead of going out into the wild looking for it, bring it in and make your own yard wild and invite friends over to forage. Uh, yes, that, that's absolutely true. But I do want to say that among the different types of foraging, there is some types of foraging that have less of an impact than other types. Like, for example, berry picking and nut gathering. 
uh, those are relatively benign foraging activities because all you're doing is gathering the seed dispersal portion of the organism. And there's often a lot of those around. And so if you gather some, it's not that big deal at all. The, the potential problem impacts on foraging is when you're digging up plants to harvest them or you're stripping all the flowers or all the leaves off plants to harvest them. That's going to be really traumatic for the plant. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so yes, yeah, so uh, I would, um, I try to point people toward the uh, more benign types of foraging. And also, you know, uh, uh, we mentioned dandelions. Dandelions are weed. There's also edible invasive species like Japanese knotweed and garlic mustard and dame's rocket and uh, autumn olive. These are all delicious plants and they're, um, they're not important to the ecosystem. If anything, they're deleterious to the ecosystem. So I won't claim that harvesting these plants to eat them is an effective control method, because I don't think it is. But my attitude about edible invasive species is that if they're in the landscape, I mean, if the ecologists go at them and eradicate them from an area, fine. But in the meantime, if they're there and they're edible, uh, I'm going to eat them and I'm going to teach other people how to eat them too. And that's a uh, eating invasives is a guilt-free foraging opportunity because you don't have to worry about oh you know am I disrupting the ecosystem by harvesting these as long as you don't spread the plants around in the process but that is easily avoidable. Wonderful, mm -hmm. I'm just so thrilled that uh, Russ you joined us tonight, Jody. I don't know if you uh, were were almost to your end that you suggested, but if people are interested in watching a third one, do we want to go ahead and play that third tape? We're happy to if everyone would like to. It's a 14 minute uh, video for the next one. How does everyone feel? Good. I see nods and thumbs <laughs> up, so I guess we're good. That's good. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Russ Cohen, and here we are along the glorious Riverwalk footpath along the Housatonic River in the scenic town of Great Barrington, Massachusetts in the Berkshires. And we're here this morning to look at the edible wild plants that are growing along Riverwalk. And this is a great place to see and learn about edible wild plants. It's not a great place to actually pick and harvest them, but it's a great place to learn about them all right, here on the edge of the river walk near the rain garden, we have a patch of sumac plants. Now this obviously isn't poison sumac or I wouldn't be grabbing it like this. So how did I know it wasn't poison sumac? Well, there's a couple ways to tell. One way is just from the leaves itself. So this whole thing is a leaf. Here's a good example of it. So this is what is known as a compound leaf. This whole thing is one leaf and these are called leaflets. You see how long and pointy and toothy these leaflets are. Poison sumac has much more egg-shaped leaflets and they don't have teeth. So that's one way to tell just from that. This particular species of sumac is called staghorn sumac because the um, young growth on the plant, uh, these developing young parts at the ends of the uh, woodier twigs, they're furry like young deer antler velvet. So uh, there are, there are, there's this one, the staghorn sumac. There's also the smooth sumac and the wing sumac. So those are three of the more common uh, native sumacs that you're likely to encounter in Massachusetts. And all of those produce tight, upright clusters of red berries. It's another way to distinguish the edible sumacs from the poison sumac, because the poison sumac produces these loose drooping clusters of white berries uh, that look like poison ivy berries because poison ivy and poison sumac are very closely related. So any sumac that's got these tight upright clusters of red berries that are shaped like I'm holding my hand right now, that's not only not poison sumac, it's an edible sumac. So here behind me you see many stems of the sumac plants and my guess is that these are all one single organism, that this is all a common root system that these individual shoots are sharing. And so although they look like separate plants, my guess is that they're just coming off a communal root system. 
So it's basically one giant clone that we're looking at here. The other thing that I'm guessing is that this is a male sumac plant because ordinarily at the end of May when we're filming this, we would still be able to see the leftover berry clusters from last year's sumac plants on the plants. And the fact that we're not seeing any berry clusters here tells me that this is probably uh, a male plant. But anyway, the edible part are the berries and those are gonna be out uh, in midsummer onward. And so as I described before, you're gonna look for these uh, bright red clusters of berries on the plants about the same size and shape as my hand. And, um, and the plants, the sumac plants will be covered for them, covered with them in the summer. So what you need to do when you see the ripe sumac berry clusters is to test it and see if it's ripe. So what I will do is lick my finger and then rub it on the berry cluster and lick my finger again. And if I got a nice, strong, pleasing acid flavor, then I know the berries were ripe and ready to use. And if that berry cluster I tested was ripe, uh, it's very likely that all the other berries on the plant will be the same degree of ripeness. So you just break those berry clusters off, bring them home. And this is all described in my book. I've got a chapter on sumac in my book, but basically you just put the ripe berry clusters in a bowl of water and you knead them in the water like you're kneading bread dough for like five or so minutes and you're getting the flavor off the berries into the water and the water will turn this pink or pinkish orange color and then fish the berries out, you're done with them, take the liquid and put it through any kind of a filter like a paper towel, and let it drip through the paper towel and that will hold back any remaining uh, berries or hairs or anything else that's in the, uh, the liquid and then that will strain it. And then what goes through that filter, you can drink hot or cold, sweetened or unsweetened. And I typically drink it cold and sweetened like pink lemonade. In fact, I've heard a story and I think this is plausible that the whole reason there is something called pink lemonade is because people were drinking the sumac drink. They, you know, going back to the earliest times when they learned about it from the Native Americans that used sumac and then they uh, uh, became accustomed to drinking the sumac drink and lemons arrived later. And so for people to get comfortable drinking lemonade, they colored it pink so it more closely resembled the sumac aid that people were already used to drinking. So, uh, so this is uh, um, a species that you often see on the edge of school ball fields or vacant lots and stuff like that. Uh, because it can tolerate uh, conditions where the uh, soil has been disturbed and the plant community has been disturbed. But that is its native habitat, its native niche that it um, uh, seeks out. And so uh, you don't have to go to a river to see it. Sumac can tolerate uh, dry habitats and lots of other conditions. All right, let's see what else we can find. All right, here, right along the Riverwalk pathway, we've got a couple examples of one of our edible birch trees. So this particular one, I call it black birch. Some people call it sweet birch or cherry birch. The botanical name is Betula lenta. And, um, and this one I tend to lump together with the yellow birch because uh, they're usable the exact same way. So if you see a tree that looks like this, you want to look at the twigs and um, and by the way the leaf on a birch tree it reminds me of the leaf that's on the outside of the briar's ice cream box so i look for that and then as i find a twig what i want to do is just scratch the outer bark off like that to expose the inner bark and give it a sniff and if you found a black birch you'll get the uh, wintergreen smell uh, which is oil of wintergreen, and it is in the inner bark of the black or yellow birch tree. And so that's uh, the scratch and sniff test to know you've got the right thing. You can make a drink from these twigs, 
and you can do this any time of year. Uh, if you find black or yellow birches, you can just gather the twigs and uh, get a, uh, a knife or a carrot peeler and just peel the bark off the twigs and then put the peeled twigs and the bark that you peeled off of them into a glass jar with water and just let it sit around for an hour. And that's how you get a wonderful uh, wintergreen flavored drink without having to add anything. Now, the, the, there is a medicinal use for this oil of wintergreen too. Uh, the uh, chemical name of oil of wintergreen is methyl salicylate, and it is related to salicylic acid, which is the active ingredient in aspirin. And so the oil of wintergreen does have a pain-killing effect. So if you were hiking in the woods and you twisted your ankle, you could find a black or yellow birch twig to chew on. At the very least, it would distract you from the pain in your ankle. Now, one last thing about uh, eating birch trees, and this is true not for just black or yellow birches, but for any species of birch, is you can tap a birch tree for sap. Now, obviously, a tree like this is going to be too small in diameter. You'd want to have a tree that's at least eight inches or more in diameter. And there are certainly places in Massachusetts where the birches get that big. And, uh, and so this is true for any species of birch, so gray birch, uh, black or yellow, those are the three most common ones in Massachusetts, is you tap the trees just like you would a maple tree and you can extract the sap and drink the sap just plain or you can make stuff with the sap. And the sap starts flowing a couple maples a couple weeks after the maples stop flowing. So in this part of the state that would be like the beginning of April is when I think about tapping birch trees for sap. And uh, I had some, we had some birch trees on my family's land in Eastern Mass and we tapped them uh, for sap in the spring and we were getting a gallon of sap per hour uh, out of these taps. So the trees really gush. Unfortunately, the sap is even waterier than maple sap, so you have to boil the heck out of it to get anything. And what you eventually get looks and tastes just like molasses, but molasses is so cheap and so easy to get at the stores. My advice would be to just go buy molasses. You're not going to save any time or money having made your own molasses from birch sap. Having said that, if let's say you were camping during the time of the year when the birch sap was flowing and you were concerned about the potability of the water supplies at the place where you're camping, is you could tap the birch trees then and get all the pure, clean, clean drinking water you needed that way. All right, so here on this choke cherry plant, we're seeing uh, the very beginning of the cherries as the plant has bloomed and now the little cherries are forming on the plant. So these would be ripe in August and they'll have a maroon color to them when they're ripe and, uh, and not shiny. Were this to be a uh, black cherry racine on the ripe fruit, it would be uh, quite dark, purpley black in color and shiny. And uh, choke cherries are called choke cherries just because if you eat them raw, they make your uh, mouth pucker. But uh, uh, choke cherries are used to make a choke cherry jam and jelly. And, um, and black cherries can be uh, quite good for eating just plain straight off the plant. But this one uh, tends to be better uh, uh, jam or jelly or Native Americans would dry the fruit and then uh, use it as an ingredient in pemmican, the Native American equivalent of power bars. And uh, it's very typical to see uh, the choke cherry is a shrubby tree as we are here along Riverwalk uh, and black cherries get to be much, much taller, like 50 or 60 feet tall. Uh, uh, but this tends to be more diminutive cousin. So just a few feet from those choke cherries is a hawthorn plant. And this one's still blooming, as we can see. And uh, it has uh, white flowers with five petals, which is characteristic of many uh, species uh, also in the rose family. And uh, hawthorns, another way to identify the plant when the uh, flowers aren't on the plant is to look for the thorns, okay? And uh, if you see right here, the end of the plant has a thorn to it right there where my finger is. And this is actually rather small for hawthorns. Sometimes hawthorn uh, thorns can be two or more inches long and quite um, intimidating. So uh, the main edible part on a hawthorn 
are the ripe fruits and those will be out toward the end of the summer and they'll be red and look like little miniature apples and they taste like little miniature apples and the flavor of hawthorn fruits varies quite a lot from uh, shrub to shrub so my advice is to taste one and see what you think and if you like it then you can uh, gather some of those fruit and eat it and if you don't uh, don't give up on hawthorns just keep trying them you might find one that you like better so besides tasting good, hawthorns have a very good reputation medicinally as being good for the heart. And you can get your medicine just by eating the hawthorns and making tea from the, uh, the ripe hawthorn fruits. Here at Riverwalk, it's been great for me because of the particular interest in native plants and so I have been leading walks here for many years talking about the edibility of plants. Many of these species are very appropriate for people to establish in their own yards. And perhaps they'll get the idea from seeing the plants at Riverwalk that, gee, this plant is nice. It would be nice to have this in my own yard. And then they can uh, establish uh, their own growth there. And of course, once the plant's growing in your own yard, uh, you can nibble on it all you want. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, this little excursion we've had along River Walk with. That was wonderful. It's been so long since I have walked along uh, that pathway. It's a reminder for me for the year. Oh. You're wait. You're you're up. You need to unmute, Russ. <laughs> there we go. All right. So this is what I'm working on while my video has been playing. <laughs> so I've been separating shagbark hickory nuts from their shells, which is my form of knitting while a Zoom program is on. And so I did about um, uh, eight ounces worth of nuts just in an hour. So uh, this is what a shagbark hickory nut looks like when it falls off the shell. So this part is shiny and green. And so you look underneath the trees, uh, as I said before, from like mid-September through the end of October. And this husk comes off in four parts. And then this is what it looks like inside. And this is what I crack open to get the nut meats. And I find that if I tip the nut on its side like that and put it on a hard surface, not my hand, but like a rock. <laughs> and I hit it straight here on the top with a hammer. And I don't pulverize it, but I hit it just hard enough to send cracks to the shell. More often than not, the two halves open right up. And that's how I get the big pieces out. That's the secret to shelling shagbark hickory nuts. And then I use this dental tool to separate the, the recalcitrant nut meats from the shells that are still embedded in there. If you never had them, shagbark hickory nuts taste like walnuts have been lightly sprayed with maple syrup. So they're really awesome. Ooh. <laughs> Quite a description. Okay. Well, are there any other questions for Russ or Meredith about um, either the information uh, he's been able to talk about or Meredith's uh, Westfield River program, the wild and scenic. Okay. So then, if you're not on the wild and scenic um, email list and you would like to be, uh, we will happily add you. It's hard to know what the programming will be this year, but we do try to um, bring these things to life. And I'll be talking with Jody and Russ about looking for a spot that would make sense in Beckett uh, to build our own edible river walk and starting with a, a larger concept design and maybe plugging away at it little by little. That would be wonderful. Well, sounds like we're gonna wrap up. Thank you all so Meredith, much. Meredith, I do have a comment. Oh, okay, yeah. Hi, Gail. What I want to tell you that is, so you can go on your river walk in the future. Berkshire County has a thousand COVID shots really ready and available, okay? And I put them on the website tonight, okay? That you can all sign up for your COVID shots in Berkshire County, okay? And that's anybody over 75? Over 75, okay. Yep, and 
Uh, don't take a picture of your insurance card. Don't worry about your insurance card, okay? Just put your insurance numbers in. Use Chrome if you sign up. And if you have a problem, I do have counsel and aging agencies to assist you, okay? Uh, and they're all website? on the Beckett website. Thank Beckett you. Beckett website. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Welcome. thank you. So that we all can share this in the future with Russ and Meredith and the Beck and Anthony and I'll be together. Great. Um, Jody, do you intend to do the other two or shall we share where people can access that if you want to send that? Well, link? I did I did share the link uh, right. to the Wild and Scenic uh, River. It's on the chat if anyone wants that. Um, we also send out um, a post event survey that'll be coming to everyone and we can have the links in there as well. But we are also more than happy to schedule it so we can have a question and answer and discussion involved as well and uh, schedule it as another Zoom if that would be the preference. It is kind of nice to have access uh, to both you and Russ in the discussion. It um, enlivened it. <laughs> I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Uh, just Make sure to give me a little bit more advanced warning in case I, I know I have to. Uh... <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> serendipity worked out today. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, Meredith, let's talk. Okay. And and figure out another evening, and we'll show a couple more of them. We'll coordinate with Russ. Um, you know, like in maybe four or five weeks, show the next set, if that sounds good. Three or four weeks, something in that range. Okay. Because I, I, I enjoyed that. It, it makes me, I, I'm deep in my seed catalogs at the moment, <laughs> you know? Uh, so this just, uh, and I forage a lot for my yard. I've taken some wild edible classes. My favorite thing in my yard that God forbid anyone pulls it thinking it's a weed is um, my wood sorrel. You know, it uh, delights me. Yeah. So uh, looking forward to that. Okay. And we will put out the information and um, go on from there. Sound good? Sounds good. Okay. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. You good too. Night. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank Bye. You. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting.